sweeter than the day before. Every morning I will worship, every evening I'll adore, because every day with you is sweeter, sweeter than the day before. Is every day sweeter when you're walking with the Lord? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. The longer you have that relationship, the better it becomes. The more you know one another. You have fellowship. Amen. One more time. Amen. 
into your presence, Lord, with a sacrifice of praise, with a song I will exalt you, Lord, blessed be your holy name, I will give you all the glory, you delivered me from shame. a short grab five people and tell them I'm here to lift him up. Quiet over there. <laughs> All right, good morning, Freedom Center. Everybody doing well? Hey. hey, Larry. I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. If you had a great Thanksgiving, let's give thanks to the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Kind of overdosed on turkey, right? It was great. Let me run through just a, uh, a couple of, uh, of announcements, if you would. First of all, you remember last week we had uh, the youth, the 
college kids, all that. Everything was no. Everything is yes this week, okay? <laughs> Amen? All right, college kids, uh, you, you all know all that deal. So we're all on, we're all back on the, the right schedule for uh, this coming week. Also, believe it or not, this is December 1st, right? Man, oh man, what happened to November, huh? Man. Okay, so this, uh, because it's December, we're going to have the first Thursday, so that'd be this Thursday, we're going to have our miracle healing service, okay? That's at uh, 7 o'clock, amen? Yeah, not too many people have been getting healed here by the... No, we've had a lot of neat healings, amen? So come, if you need to be healed or you'd like to stand in and pray for somebody, that's this Thursday at uh, 7 o'clock. Also, men, this will be the first Friday in December, which means we have men's fellowship where? Kelly's. Correct, Kelly's, okay? So this Friday, men's fellowship at, uh, at Kelly's. Also, we are supporting a function that uh, Alian is involved in, which is uh, setting the, well, her ministry is called Setting the Captives Free, and this is a Christmas, Christmas outreach to the homeless people. So, we have this form. If you want to be involved in that, there's a sign-up sheet in the back, or see Alian. Where's Alian? There. There she is, right there, okay? She does a great, uh, a great work, and this is an outreach to the homeless folks, amen? Also, if you are a first or second time visitor, would you please stand and uh, let us recognize you? First or second time, hey, hey, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Stay standing. Stay standing. This is the best time. We shower you with gifts. And uh, make sure that you fill out the form. Turn it in. What do they do? Turn it into the back table? Turn it into Chick-fil-A? I don't know. No, at the back table. And then they get a Chick-fil-A. There's Chick-fil-A sandwiches at the back table, all right? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Somehow you get a Chick-fil-A sandwich, all right? <laughs> okay. Miss Linda? Good morning. Good morning. We have so many announcements. You might want to get out your phones and your calendars. No, I'm teasing. But you might want to write down some things because there's some important information that you need to know. Next week, our children are participating in the Missouri City Christmas Parade. So we are really excited about that. Children, you're in here. Do y'all want to be in the parade? Yes. We want to represent our church in the Missouri City Christmas Parade. So parents, this is very important. They must have a permission slip period. We have them in at the back table with the wonderful and delightful Frank and Bobby Hood. Yes, they're waving to us. So make sure that you fill out that permission form, turn it in today before you leave, um, and um, because we have to have a permission slip. The children need to be here next Sunday at 8 I'm sorry, next Saturday at 8 o'clock here in the parking lot, okay? They need to wear blue jeans and a, either a solid red or green or white T-shirt, okay? And if it's cold, they can wear a turtleneck. And then we will provide the antler ears. And Pastor Greg is going to be leading them with a guitar on the float singing. So it's going to be awesome. So make sure your kids are here at 8 o'clock in the parking lot. This is important. Pickup will be here in the parking lot at 1015. So don't try to pick the children up at the end of the parade. They will have to be picked up back here at the parking lot. Um, secondly, Tuesday night is our Christmas Girls Night Out. And it starts at 6 o'clock, which y'all all know that. But I want to tell you this. Some of you are coming from work, and I understand. I used, to, I used to do the same thing. If you're a few minutes late, it's okay. Just come. I want you here with all my heart. Our message for Tuesday is going to be hope for the holidays. Hope for the holidays. Because 
Some of you have to go home for the holidays. Right? Some of you just lived it this past week. And sometimes when we're dealing with those family situations that are stretching or a little difficult, our hope gets depleted from us. And we need to be prepared as we walk into those family situations during this holiday season. So I just want you to come and get some hope so that you will have that as you face those family situations during your holidays. Um, always at the Freedom Center Church, we have done Angel Tree where we have bought gifts for children who are, their fathers are incarcerated. We're doing it a little different this year. This year, we're going to turn our eyes inward to our church family, okay? This year, if you know of a family that they're going through a, a financially time, tough time in their life, and you know that their children are not going to be having Christmas, if, if you have that information, I would like for you to call the church office this week, give us the name of the family, let us know the children's name and their ages, and then next week, so that's what you're going to do this week, okay? Is that understood? Let us know this week if there's a family that you know of that is a part of our church family who will, their children will not have Christmas. Call the office, let us know their names and their ages. Then next week, we're going to let you be angels, okay? We're going to let you sign up to buy gifts for those different children, okay? So, but this is step one of this project. This week, call the office if you know of a family that is in need, okay? And then, last thing, if you received an invitation to our volunteer banquet, if you received an invitation to our volunteer banquet, it is crucial that you RSVP so that we can know for how, how many people to prepare for. So if you received an invitation to the volunteer Christmas banquet, you must RSVP this week. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. We're going to have water baptism this morning. Amen. Read the... Yes. Let me just say this. Water baptism is very important in our Christian walk. It's not redemptive because those who are going to be baptized this morning have already had a change in their hearts. The Holy Spirit has come inside them. They confess Jesus Christ. But this is a celebration that they are born again. And number two, it's following the Lord in the sense that as according to Romans 3, as they go into the water, it's a picture of Jesus going into the grave. He was there for three days, and then he came out. And as they come up out of the water, it's a picture of them being new in Christ Jesus, clean, free from the stain of original sin. Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. Amen. All right, let's start with, uh, yes, Malad Rishani, my brother in the Lord. One thing I notice about Malad, you can see Jesus in him right away. Malad, just for the record, have you asked Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Lord and Savior? Yes, yes he has. Praise the Lord. And my brother, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Emma Grace Lee, and she's accepted Jesus Christ a long time ago, didn't you, sweetheart? Okay, but we want to ask you a question. Have you asked Jesus Christ to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior? Yes. Then, Emma, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
This is another one of my grandsons. This is Trace. Trace, for the record, how old are you? Eleven. Eleven. Okay. Trace, let me ask you a question. Have you asked Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Lord and Savior? Yes. Then I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Also, uh, I want our elders to come up here. I want the Holtons to come up here. Clayton. And, you know. They've uh, been with us for a little while, and they're going back. Yeah. Tuesday, right? Yeah. Tuesday. Early morning. Tell them all that you've done since you've been here. <laughs> well, I... I had the privilege of marrying my two oldest sons, and uh, uh, praise the Lord, Aaron and my son Eugene, somewhere, uh, was able to do a baby dedication to a brother that's radically saved, Eric. I, he may be a little bit late today. And uh, what else do we do? Huh? The funeral. Oh, yeah. I uh, sent my... I was able to visit with my mom and love on her and pray for her before she died. Uh, God just held her, and three days after we fellowshiped with her, she went to be with the Lord. So that was a real blessing. I pray that the Lord would hold her here. So it's been a, it could have been a, an emotional roller coaster, but the peace of God was just overwhelming and such a joy knowing that he's in control. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Well, y'all are, <clears throat> wow, that was loud. Y'all are a blessing to us. And um, we pray for you guys and think of you all the time and just so thankful for you and that we're connected to y'all and what you're doing in the Philippines and uh, that you're an ambassador to Christ. And we're, we know that we're an extension to that too because of being one in the Spirit. And so we just want as a body to pray for you. And uh, it's obvious just from from the the busyness of your time here and the events that transpired that God's ordered your steps. Amen. You know, he's ordered your steps. And it might not have been how you wanted everything to unfold, but he's ordered your steps and uh, in a unique way. And as you go back, he's going to order your steps there as well. So we just want to pray for you. Father, we, we love this family. And we love, Father, Lord, the, uh, the passion that they have for your kingdom and for your gospel and for Jesus, and for conveying that message, Father, to others. And Father, we know that uh, the peace of God, you are all over them, Father. Your peace abounds on them. And Father, you have ordered their steps. And Lord, it just have, you have ordered their steps as they've been here in the States during this window of time. You've ordered their, their steps, Father, as they go back to the islands there, Father. And we pray for that precious island there. And for all of those people, Lord God, that they'll come into contact with and that they've built relationships with. And, Lord, even through the storm that they've gone through, Lord, that there are people that are putting things back together, Lord, that they'll be a part of so much, Lord God, that it'll be for your kingdom. Ministering, Father, to physical needs, but also to spiritual needs, Father. And we thank you for them. And we just ask your blessings upon them right now as they go. We ask your protection upon them as they go. We ask your favor upon them as they go. We ask, Father, that you would just order all of their steps, Father. And thank you, Father, for the connection that we have and the opportunity that we have to pray for them and to be uh, connected to them and lift them up in prayer. And we will be diligent to do that, Father, and faithful to do that. Father, there's, there's no divide of an ocean between us, Lord God, because we're connected by your Spirit. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the power of prayer. And we thank you for the power of your Spirit. And, Father, we bless them as they go. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Yes. I'd just like to say thank you to the congregation. Yeah. I
I, I just want to tell you how profu profusely we are thankful for Freedom Center. Uh, each one of you have been a vital part in what God is doing in the Philippines. And I believe it's because of the prayers that uh, God spared the island that we're on. And uh, your love and support have been so important for us and the body of Christ. And just want to encourage you that uh, being a part of this is, is not a trite thing. It's not a, a light thing. It's a very important part of your walk toward Christ. And uh, we just want to tell you we love you and thank you so much again. And, and our, uh, our packages, right? Oh, um, Terry, Terry from uh, this church organized 11 boxes to bless the children of the Philippines. And I just heard from my niece in the Philippines the other day, and she said that she, they receive it already, so we will have a very, very joyful Christmas this December. So thank you. 70, I believe Linda, 70 backpacks full of... 70 or 80? 70. So uh, we'll be sending you pictures of the children with their big smiles digging these goodies inside the backpacks. So thank you very much. In January, we will be doing a 21-day fast again. Um, and we'll talk about that more as that approaches, but I haven't spoken a lot of it lately, and I want to encourage you that you should be praying a minimum of 30 minutes a day. You just should be. You should be praying more than that. It says pray without ceasing, correct? But make a list, and the Holton should be on your list. You should be praying for them. Jasper, he's another one. He's on my list. And, and more and more, we're getting more connected with them. Uh, the, the last Sunday, I shared with you, Jasper texted me on my phone, praying for your body today. That y'all have a glorious day. And then during the week, I think they had a healing service on Wednesday. Pray for us as we have our healing service. Well, guess what? I'll be texting him. Pray for us as we have our healing service on Thursday. Amen? But the power of prayer is powerful and it's awesome you need to commit yourself to that amen let's stand and worship tis the season to be jolly tis the season to be merry and to have joy
desire today, so we draw near, Lord, to you, Lord. It all goes back to you. Romans eleven thirty six 36 tells us that it all comes from you for us to use for a time. And then we bring it all back to you, including the glory that might have been gained while we were using everything that you gave us. So we draw nearer to your throne. Today, uh, the title is uh, Be Thankful. Be Thankful. And just looking at that verse, it, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. The biggest word out of that sentence is enter. <laughs> I will enter. I will enter. Father, we thank you that your grace and your mercy has provided a way to enter. That your blood took care of an issue that had separated us from you. You resolved that. Lord, you put your spirit inside of us and you paved a way, a path that we can now boldly come before your throne of grace. We thank you, Father. We do want to draw nearer and nearer and nearer to your presence. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. And we praise you for your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give me one minute. Y'all have a seat for a moment. Is Clever and Karina here? Why don't y'all come forward? Matter of fact, we'll just go on the platform so everybody can see. <laughs> uh oh. That's all right. Last month before our healing service, we shared some testimony of healing. And, you know, the purpose of that is to give, first of all, God all the glory. He gets all the glory. The second is to boost and energize you that you'll have faith and you'll believe and you'll pray fervently for others and expect. And so we want to give some folks in our body the chance to rejoice and we want to rejoice with them because I tell you we have prayed and we have prayed and we have prayed and I'm gonna let clever tell the story um, but it did begin at a healing was it a healing service that you, you yes. came to mm -hmm. and uh, I remember you were down on that end and I came to you and clever said uh, pray that I feel and he, I, I, I took it you didn't mean that in a physical sense you meant that in a spiritual sense and, and I was like I know exactly what he's talking about I'm going to pray for you and, uh, because I've been there and then it was weeks that followed or 
to where you discovered um, a, a, a tumor on Samantha, correct? I'm going to let you tell the rest of that. <laughs> um, first, I want to say that the message today, be thankful, is a good message. It's going to be a good message. Um, in 23 days, it's going to be one year when I went to Samantha's room, and she was just laying down, and of course, you know, we were going to go Christmas shopping, and I discovered a little bulge on her right side. And I went, and I can actually cup it, and I was like, okay, this is not good. So then I called uh, Karina to come over and just take a look at it. So we first, you know, process elimination. We went and said, maybe she needs to go to the bathroom. Okay. So we take her to the bathroom, and still she came out, and we laid her back down, and still you can see the bulge. So Karina called the pediatrician, and the good thing they were working, and actually said, hey, just come on down, and we're going to diagnose her. Um, when Dr. Zeitz, who's her pediatrician for Texas Children, took, took a look at her and said, okay, this is not normal. Um, so then we went to West Campus for Texas Children, and they did an ultrasound, and they discovered a mass uh, if you actually look, if you go grocery shopping, you, those big red delicious apples, they're like this big. That's the size of the actual mass through the actual ultrasound. Um, and of course, we were worried and everything like that, but the doctor said, well, maybe it could be, you know, favorable, which is really nothing that we should need to worry about. Um, and then this is where she comes in. <laughs> Um, they sent us to Texas Children Main Campus um, in an ambulance, rushed, and they did an ultrasound again, and they did a CT scan, and maybe around 11 o'clock at night, they came back to us um, and told us that it was a tumor. Um, it was a tumor protruding from her kidney, and they could not tell us if it was um, malignant or not, but most likely that it was cancerous because tumors in children are cancerous, um, and that we would, we, would, um, get an, we would be admitted and get an appointment with an oncologist and see a surgeon. Um, there was no option in that. As soon as they gave us the news, um, they told us, both doctors, a team of doctors that came in, they said, you are very calm about the news. And we said, yes, because we know that God is with us and he's going to take care of it. Um, as soon as the doctors left, I called the church, knowing that it was closed, but I called the church, hoping that um, somebody would receive my message. Um, on December 25th, Ms. Linda called me. Um, she said that for some reason she came to the office, she had to check some things, that Pastor Greg and Miss Linda were out of town, but they would call me the next day. I said, okay. I hung up, not really thinking they're going to call, but sure. <laughs> um, needless, on the 26th, I received a phone call from Miss Linda, and she said, hi, my name is Ms. Li um, Linda, I'm Pastor Greg's wife, I heard your message, tell me about it. As soon as she paused, I just started crying. And she let me cry for a good minute or so, and then she said, okay, we're done. She's like, we're gonna pray, and we're gonna know that Jesus is, is in control. I said, yes, ma'am. I told her what I knew at that point, and um, she, you know, she prayed with me. She prayed um, with Samantha Hearing, and then um, we hung up. About three days later, um, they told us, the, her oncologist called us and told us that it was a stage three Wilms tumor, very um, unfavorable histology, and that was extremely, extremely aggressive for the fact that it, um, in September it was not there, and then um, for December, for it to be there and to be so big, they knew that they had to um, get, attack it quickly. Um, she went into surgery in January. Uh, Pastor Greg and Miss Linda and um, her two dance teachers were there on surgery day at 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, stayed with us. Um, and she got out of surgery about four or five hours later. Um, and to her surgeon, they said, she said, he said that it was the... Um, shortest sur surgery that he's ever done for five hours. So we were very thankful for that. He told us that the tumor with the kidney was the size of a, a huge pineapple. So if seeing her, imagine that coming out of her body. Um, he, he believed that he got everything. He believed that um, everything was fine and that only two lymph nodes were affected. 
um, but he was in concern. So for us to hear that from a surgeon, we knew that God was in that sur surgeon room and, and being there with us. Um, she went through two weeks of radiation to make sure the um, two lymph nodes were okay and nine months of chemotherapy. Uh, she did lose her hair. Um, she never missed a beat on her chemotherapy. Uh, her doctors were extremely amazed that every time her platelets went down to zero or her red blood cells went down to zero or her white blood cells went down to zero, I would call Miss Linda. I said, Miss Linda, I really need prayer right now. And then the next day we would go into treatment and her blood platelets and all her cells were up and ready to go for chemo treatment. There were several times that her doctor was just absolutely amazed, and she was said, no, this can't be right, let's run it again. And because it would go from zero to 375, from one day to another, just knowing that the body of Christ was praying with us. Um, in May, she did get a huge sore in her, throat, in her mouth. It was the size of a quarter, the depth of about two centimeters. Um, she lost about four pounds because she was unable to eat, but the whole entire time she kept saying that God was going to heal her, that God was going to heal her. And she ate and she gave it all. Um. With her whole chemo treatment, um, she still had the encouragement to come to church because she wanted to go to uh, church school, as she calls it. And, you know, special thank you to all the parents who do have, you know, your kids inside her class, Miss Terry. Terry's class. Um, they never saw her different. Um, she never took off her hat. She loves her hats. Um, and just the fact that everyone welcomed her back whenever she was there, because ever since January uh, 3rd, when she had her surgery, we never had a weekend. All the weekends were either at the hospital or recovering from her treatment. Um, <clears throat> they gave her five severe drugs to make sure that everything was, um, was gone. And of course, she, she has her own stories where she did a drawing of a boy crying. And uh, she, she relayed the, the actual story to a nurse. She said to the nurse, you know, boys, whoever, whoever doesn't know Jesus, they cry. So she's saying about the boy. And then she asked the nurse, do you know Jesus? And the ironic thing was that the nurse paused and couldn't answer her. So, um, of course, coming from a child, and that's not something that we have taught her or anything like that. It was just out of her own will. Um, of course, her little sister was a big support as well, too, um, being bedside with her and didn't want to leave each other. So that's a good thing as well, too. But just we're very thankful of this church accepted us um, as what we should do, right, whenever people are in need. Um, but there's no words that can actually describe just seeing my daughter here. She did have a, a cancer buddy that did go away with the Lord uh, back in August back in August, where she gave her spot to him because she was going to have surgery first, but he was at a worse condition. And um, his cancer actually went to his lungs because the way the Wilms tumor works, it starts in your kidney first. If you don't control it, it actually progresses to your lungs. And once um, it got to his lungs, the doctors just couldn't assist him with anything else with him. But just seeing her and getting her strength, she does still have some side effects, which we, go, we are addressing right now. Um, she may be walking and then just goes down to the ground um, due to the muscles from one of the drugs. Uh, but we have some PT coming in, so that will strengthen her up and more prayers. Um, but just seeing her and the spirit that she has when she comes to church school. Actually, she was getting a little bit antsy in the back, saying, Mom, I want to go to church school. Oh, can we, are we done? Are we going to do it? <laughs> So that's good. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Say I have a testimony. I have a testimony. What is it? <laughs> Tell her what it is. <laughs> God, healed me. God healed me. Amen. Thank you. 
Thank you for all your prayers. Thank you for all your prayers. Tell them what you do every time you do a CT scan. Mm, pray. And what else do you do? What do you put on? The armor of God. The armor of God. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really want to say thank you, especially to um, all the church, to Miss Linda and, and Pastor Greg and um, the parents of the children that are in Miss Terry's class because without their encouragement, the letters, the little cards and everything, we wouldn't be here and it wouldn't um, give her the encouragement to keep going. The whole entire time she always said, Mama. She said, Mama, I'm a freedom fighter and I can't, I'm not going to lose. I said, no, baby, you're not. So thank you so much. Amen. Y'all hold on just a minute. <laughs> Father, we give you thanks right now for this precious family. And Father, we thank you for every step of the way, the way you have given revelation, Father, the way you have provided, Lord, the way you have uh, covered them, Father, with grace, Lord, with your, your presence, and Father, the way you've touched Samantha's body. And Father, we thank you for that. We have prayed and we prayed, Father. And your word told us to keep knocking and keep knocking and keep asking and keep believing. And Father, we, we, we did that, Lord. And we want to give you the praise. And we want to give you the thanks. For you are worthy of all praise, Lord God. Every good gift comes from you. And we thank you for this precious family. And we thank you, Father, for your touch on their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, what a powerful testimony that is. Uh, wow, thank you, Jesus. Um, this uh, this appropriate time of year for that at Thanksgiving. It's, uh, we get so wrapped up in, uh, in all the, the publicity and the hype of the holidays, but really when we look around us and, and look at our family members and what life's all about and what God has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ, uh, those testimonies uh, truly bring it home. Amen. Oh, it's time to take up our tithes and offerings this morning. Uh, if you're giving cash offerings, uh, please raise your hand. The ushers have envelopes so we can make record uh, of your giving. Uh, this time of year, there's a lot of pressure financially from all sorts of uh, areas in our lives uh, at this time of year. So I encourage you to, to really stay uh, focused on Scripture, what God tells us. Because when, when we read Scripture about giving, it's always about the giver. We rarely... The, the scripture really tells, really tells us about the receiver. We're to be thankful if you're a recipient of a gift, but it's really about the giver. God, God is preparing our hearts to be givers because that's, that's part of the purpose that we serve within the kingdom of God is to be a giver of the resources that he's entrusted to you. You're just a steward of those finances. And, you're to, <clears throat> and with that stewardship, you're to partake in his kingdom. You take care of your family. You, you sow seeds in different ways. You make investments, but you also plant those seeds for eternal giving, internal into the kingdom of God. Here at the Freedom Center, we have a responsibility as the eldership to take those resources and put them to use for God. We're the Bridge Project, which you've been hearing a lot about. We reach out to the community. We serve you all with those resources. But without you all sowing those resources, these things would not happen. Amen. So let's pray this morning that, that God will truly bless each and every one of us for the giving that, that takes place. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come forward, Lord. We just uh, thank you for this opportunity to sow financial seeds, Lord, into your work, into your kingdom, Lord. We pray that you produce fruit, Lord, that, that serves your mission, your glory, and ultimately give, gives Jesus Christ the message of the gospel to each and every person we come in contact with, Lord. We thank you for the freedoms that we have in this country that can, we can openly worship and profess you, Lord, as our Lord and Savior. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm on the highway of worship, I'm on the freeway of praise, I'm on the road of celebration, headed for the throne of grace, I'm on the streets of rejoicing, I'm on the
the avenue of thanks I'm on the boulevard to Jesus And I'm riding the rick of praise Shake off those heavy bands Lift up those holy hands Don't need no luggage, don't need no love Just keep that rig moving down the road We're gonna give it up, crank the sound Put the pedal to the metal down to the ground We're gonna ride this rig of praise It's cruising the day I'm on the streets of rejoicing I'm on the avenue of thanks I'm on the boulevard of Jesus And I'm riding the ring of praise One may dance, another may bow Yet another may stand and shout No matter how you express yourself As long as you get that praise on out You can hold still, spin around thanks with a grateful heart give thanks to the Holy One give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son give thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. And now let the weak say.
give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. thanks you have much to be thankful for I tell you right now as you're sitting there or standing there remember list it bring to remembrance the things that the Lord has done for you Where would we be without him? Lord, the fact that we are here and the fact that we're breathing air, <laughs> we have much to be thankful for. The word says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end of it is death. Lord, that's my work. That's my path. But you intervened, Lord God. By your grace and your mercy, you changed my path. Lord, in every good thing, every sweet thing, Lord, and even the good things that are produced for what the enemy meant for harm, that you work it for good, every bit of it, Lord. The entire journey from beginning to end, Lord God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks in all things, for that is your will concerning us in Christ Jesus. We give you thanks. We give you thanks. Give thanks. Be thankful. I think I called this thing something else originally, but I always go and look for a graphic of what I think it's supposed to be called, and I saw, I don't know if, they, if he used it or not, but I found this graphic with the guy with his hands extended out, and it, it said, be thankful. There it is. I said, I'm changing my title. <laughs> that graphic will do. Be thankful. 
be thankful. In everything, give thanks. It's not just a holiday. <laughs> it's a way of life. Be thankful. Don't, in your heart, blessed when you give unto your children and they turn around and they say, thank you, Daddy. Whew. I love that. Do you know, my kids, they could manipulate me with thankfulness. They really could. Because that blesses me so much, I want to bless them. I can't tell you how many times, and Gregory, close your ears just for a minute so you, you don't realize what you're doing. But we'll be in a store, and he'll say, you know, uh, Daddy, can I have that? And I'll say, no. Thank you, Daddy. Okay. Doesn't back talk me. Doesn't whine about it. I'm just sitting over there thinking about it now. And it takes me just a couple minutes. To, okay, get it. <laughs> and guess what he always says when he gets it? Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Daddy. It's gratitude. It's thankfulness. Be thankful. Be thankful. Psalms 104, two weeks ago, this was in my spirit for today. This passage, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Uh, Dr. Dave gave me this quote that said I could use it. I'm using it, Dr. Dave says that the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. You know, when you look at the Old Testament, you remember we were looking at David's life and we saw how David walked in such faith and, and operating in what we would call spirit-filled living and say, wow, that's, that's New Testament stuff right there that he's walking in. You find that all the time in the Old Testament. You find Jesus all over the place in the Old Testament. I love it when the Old, New Testament jumps out of the Old Testament. Of course, you go to the New Testament, and what are the disciples saying? They're quoting something out of the Old Testament, and they're saying, this is that that they were speaking of. It's being revealed. And there's a beautiful study in Scripture. It was one of the first, probably, deeper studies that I did when I became a Christian was on the tabernacle. Anybody ever study the tabernacle? Um, not, the, not Solomon's temple, but the tabernacle, Moses' tabernacle. The one that they would pitch it wherever the Spirit rested. And when the Spirit moved, they packed it up and went and re relocated wherever he was at. Right? It stayed where his presence was. And if you study the tabernacle, it's fascinating. Every detail, it's very descriptive. Not only did God give Moses the Ten Commandments, but he also gave him instructions on something that he wanted them to build. And it was the tabernacle. And he was very particular, very meticulous about things. And he calls for skilled laborers to be involved in this, this construction. And everything about that tabernacle from the wood, the Arcasia wood, which represents Jesus' humanity overlaid with gold, which represents Jesus' deity, that he was both human, he was both God. He was both human and deity at the same time. The colors that you would see, the colors had a reason. Purple for his royalty. There would be like a, a canvas skin that would be his humanity. There was, there was pictures of him all through the tabernacle. It's a fascinating study. When you get into it, there's a picture of him around every corner and every curve of that tabernacle. But what you see when you step back from it, as I always, always wonder, you know, it's like Bob Nick said, it's not so much when you look at your kids, maybe a troubled kid, it's not so much what you're doing, but why you're doing it. I want to know. I step back from, back from that, and I want to know, why did you instruct them to do that? Well, he instructed them to do that because, and he made it kind of clear in Exodus 5.1. Look at Exodus 5.1. In a conversation between Moses and Pharaoh, and afterward, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. 
Some translations may just say that they may worship me in the wilderness. But they may go. It's not just to set the Israelites free. But it was something in addition to. He wanted them to go into the wilderness. He wanted them to worship him. And then there's at least six other instances where Moses speaks directly to Pharaoh. And he tells him the purpose of God delivering his people. Not just to deliver them from captivity. But he says, release them to serve God. He said that six times. Release them to serve God. The other instances before the severe plagues were released, Moses simply would say to Pharaoh, he'd say, Thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. And this word to serve means let my people go that they may labor for me. That they may serve and perform services for me. That's what he's saying, that they may serve me. In other words, You've held my people in bondage, Pharaoh. You've forced them. You've suppressed them. You've caused them to serve your purposes. But now I want them to be released from your house of slavery. I want them to go into the wilderness. And I want them to build. And I want them to serve and labor for me. That's what he's saying. And what was that labor? Well, we see in Exodus 25, 8 through 9. He begins to unfold what his purpose was for that tabernacle. What his intentions were. Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. There it is. Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. According to all that I'm going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture, just so you shall construct it. God was making his move on humanity. God had lost the ability to dwell with humanity as he once did in the garden. You go look in the garden. God came and he walked with Adam in the cool of the day. Well, sin destroyed that. Sin messed that up. What this is about, it's about a dwelling place. You know, really, you look at the word, there's a theme of dwelling place from the beginning to the end of it. What is the first verse of the Bible? In the beginning, God created what? The heavens and the earth. Well, what in the world is that but a dwelling place? It's where it starts. And then what do we see in Revelations 21? A new heaven and a new earth coming down. Well, what in the world is that? A dwelling place. Well, guess what the tabernacle is? A dwelling place. It's a dwelling place. Dwelling places are important. If you don't think dwelling places are important, go home and make a mess of your house and see how long that rides well with your wife. Because dwelling places are important. That's why men like a man cave. We like a place where it kind of looks messy the way we want it to look messy. Amen. I built my own man cave. When we first moved in the house, there was a place for everybody but not me. Linda maybe put all my John Wayne paraphernalia in the back bathroom. Did I ever tell you that story? I, I, I have a silhouette of John Wayne. And when you came into the bathroom, it was behind the door. And Curry, we'd had a fellowship over our house, and Curry needed to go to the bathroom. Excuse me, Curry, they, they're probably streaming. <laughs> but I sent him to the back bathroom, and I didn't warn him. And he walks into the bathroom, and he shuts the door. And all of a sudden, you know, the hair of the back of his neck stands up because he thinks somebody's staring at him. It's John Wayne right behind him. It was a little bit weird, to be honest. And finally one day I poked a, he a hole into the, the uh, ceiling of the garage because I'm outside looking thinking, boy, there's a lot of space above my garage that I don't have any access to. Poked my head up there and said, well, there's plenty of room here for a man cave. <laughs> About four years later, I completed that man cave. But we got her done, right? I have a man cave. And John Wayne resides there. <laughs> but when you step out of that man cave... I have no jurisdiction over what pictures go on the wall and where do they go or what furniture goes here or there. That's her nest. And I'm good with that. Mama happy? I'm happy. <laughs> Amen? You know what I'm talking about. You wouldn't be laughing. <laughs> People don't laugh if it's not true. We can have our pet peeves about our dwelling places. God had his pet peeves about his. He was very meticulous in instructing them how that dwelling place was to be built. 
He had a design for it. It was created to dwell in, for him to inhabit. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. Enter his courts with praise. I think the first instruction that we look at that scripture is simply the word enter. He created a habitat. He was creating a pathway. He was creating a way for once again for man and God to dwell together. And that tabernacle was like phase one of what he was beginning to do. He said, enter. Enter his gates. Enter his courts. So you might be here today, you think that church is just, you know, coming to church, let's check it off for the week, pay our weekly tithe, show up on Sunday, expect the music to be good, expect the service not to be too long, hope the preacher preaches an inspiring message, hope he stays away from anything controversial. Wait one minute. See, if you showed up here for any other reason but to gather with other believers so that you could collectively enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, you came here for the wrong reason. We're to come together to pursue the presence of God together corporately. It's a corporate instruction. It's not a solo instruction. He's talking to the Israelites of what they should do. You know, uh, I look at this passage, entering his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, I look at it as a, kind of a flow. If you ask Brother Don, I talk to him constantly about an intentional flow in worship. Your, your worship begins somewhere and it's supposed to go somewhere. Um, there is a method to the madness, actually, when we put lists together and we try to come here and inspire you to worship. There's a, there's, a, there's a method behind it. I do believe, I think in terms of entering his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, and I see myself walking through that court and coming to the laver and just washing myself in the water of the word and then stepping into the holy place and then making my way to the holy of holies because I have access there. It's a pathway to the throne. Worship for me is like that. I enter celebratory, and then you shift into throne room because that's where you're heading. You're heading to the throne. It's a pathway. It, it's, it's ebb and flow. Have you heard that, ebb and flow? I looked that up because I've used that term many times and didn't really know where that came from. Do you know it's actually also known as ebb and flood? Did you know that? Anybody? A few people. Ebb and flood because it has to do with the rise and fall of sea tides. But metaphorically, we use it in increase and decrease. A flow. A flow. Music flows. Music is not music without flow. It flows. That's why, depending on what song, we took you on a little flow right there. Da -da 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 -da. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> right? Give thanks. Whoa. There's a flow. It caused you to move. It caused you to do something. It's ebb and flow. It's movement. It's, it's natural. It's a natural law and principle of life. In secular music, the best records, records, okay? Albums. Thank you. <laughs> you know, the vinyl. So we're all on the same page. The greatest ones usually had about 14 songs. And you know what they did? And I'm talking about classic ones. I'm, I'm kind of sick that way. I've, I'm the guy that sits at the radio with a stopwatch and I time songs to figure out where they're at in two minutes into that song, three minutes. That's a songwriter. Can't help it. Did the same thing with albums. Pacing time, seeing where they start with this song, the first song, and then the next song. Then the next song, then the next song, then the next song, then the next song, then the next song. And you find yourself 14 songs later thinking, wow, what a journey that was. But if you don't pay attention to that, if you hit it here and you just stay up here, all of a sudden your ears are worn out. You're tired of listening to it. Or if it goes down here and stays down here, you're going to fall asleep. It's turned into a boring album. Might get one or two hits off that album, hopefully. But for that album to be a 
Yes! I enjoyed listening to that from beginning to the end. It's ebb and it's flow from beginning to end. Life is like that. That's, that's what enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart and entering his courts with praise is about. It's setting the tempo of that flow when you come into his presence. Celebratory. Thanking him. Praising him. That's the beginning of it. That's where we begin it when we come through these doors. That's why we start with an upbeat song. And then we move into a worshipful place. You don't get to a throne room song and... yeah. <laughs> Unless you get escorted out. <laughs> you know, something wrong that you can't sense the ebb and flow. The ebb and flow. That's what that verse is about. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Now let's look at a few words. The first word I told you, the most important one is enter. None of it makes sense if we don't enter. You have to enter in. But the next one I would look at is his. That'd be the next big word. His. Because it's not yours. It's his. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. It's not your gates and it's not your courts. The temple was not man's idea. It was God's. It was God reaching out to man. The gates are his. The courts are his. Man didn't fathom up this great idea this idea was initiated by God with strict instructions down to the minutest detail of how it would be built. The gates are His. The courts are His. Just as all things, all things that we experience and are blessed with are His. That's why we enter with thanksgiving. When you start to assume credit or think that maybe you've earned stuff, that you, 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 you've just run the risk of stepping into ingratitude and arrogance, which is equated with what? Un belief. Did you know that? To be in, ungrateful is equated with unbelief. The importance of entering his gates with thanksgiving is revealing. It reveals your heart. It shows your heart. By iniquity the wicked man is ensnared, it says. But the righteous sing and rejoice. It's a description of their heart. It's an outflow. You couldn't stop it if you wanted to. Thankfulness, which is accompanied with music and sounds of celebration and rejoicing, reveal the intent and spiritual health of your heart. Romans 1, 18-23. This portion of Scripture in your Bible might have a title above it. Mine, it says, Unbelief and its Consequences. But I want you to notice one word that pops out when it's talking about unbelief. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, listen, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. See, thankfulness is equated to belief. You thank God if you believe God. <laughs> if you believe He's the creator of all things and all good things come from Him, then you will be thankful because you realize what you're experiencing and where it came from. But if you're arrogant and you think you're self-made, then you don't thank Him. And there, it's also equated with unbelief. Unbelief and the lack of thankfulness are equated. Thankfulness is the outflow or outpouring of a believing heart. A believing heart acknowledges God as a source of all things. If you fail to acknowledge God as a source of all things, you become arrogant. 
You think you've deserved something. You think you've earned something. You think you're self-made. You think you've done it yourself, which at the heart of that is what we call humanism. In regards to humanism, it eliminates God so that there's no one to be grateful to. You'll have ingratitude. You'll take things for granted. You'll even feel as if you can take the credit for the things that you've been blessed with. Unthankfulness and ingratitude are rooted in unbelief. If you say that you're a Republican, and this is not political, just if you say that you're a Republican, yet you vote Democrat, you're a Democrat regardless of your confession. If you say you're a Democrat, yet you walk into the voting booth and you pull the Republican lever, you're a Republican, not a Democrat, regardless of your bumper stickers and the signs that are in your yard. You're not defined by what you confessed. You're defined by what you do. This is why Scripture says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It also says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Meaning it's not your words that are forming you, but it's how you think. And how you think, you better look out because that will be how you act. You know, if you go, as a man thinketh in his heart, we use that kind of as a motivational thing. Go look at it in context. It's talking about the motivation of the person sitting on the other side of the table. Watch out. Because as he thinks in his heart, so is he. He's saying to you one thing, but yet he's going to do another. That's really the context of that verse. You will do as you think. You will confess anything to appear acceptable and attempt to fit in with right words, but at the end of the day, you will do what's in your heart. This is what makes a person full of integrity and upright because they do as they say. Or they're hypocrites because they fail to do what they say. See, if you say you're a believer, yet you fail to be thankful, there is a problem. Red flag. Believing is associated with thankfulness. Unthankfulness is associated with unbelief. Wow. Enter with thanksgiving, it says. The word there is tauda, meaning confession, praise, thanksgiving, give praise to God, thanksgiving in songs of liturgical worship, hymn of praise, thanksgiving, choir of, or procession or a line or company, a thank offering, sacrifice of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving has more of it, it has a connection with music in a lot of its definition. Your thankfulness is not thankfulness, however, until it is spoken. It's a confession. You're confessing your thankfulness. You're speaking your thankfulness. You must be, it must be spoken out of gratefulness. And your words should have a target. The target is God. God is creator of all things. He is the giver of all good things. He made it all. He owns it all. He controls it all. And we must vocalize our thankfulness for it all. In other words, thankfulness is literally a confession. I confess, I acknowledge, oh God, that you are creator of all things. I acknowledge that you are worthy of praise. I thank you, Lord, for what you've done in my life. Lord, I thank you for what you've done in this dear family's life. Lord, I know they're thankful for what you have done. You start thinking of all that he's done in your life. You start thanking him for your family and all the things that you're blessed with. You begin mentioning those things by name. You confess it. That's thankfulness. Thankfulness is not the reciting or the singing of a rote song. Give thanks to a grateful heart. You know, uh, you noticed in the song, I try to go to something that's just, they we're making it up on the fly. Did you hear that? Why did I do that? Because I was giving you an opportunity just to speak what's in your heart, not what was on the screen. Because that's thankfulness. Lord, help us if we need a hymnal to be thankful. Lord, help us if we need a song screen to be help to be thankful 
But it's an outflow, an outpouring of what's in your heart. That's why we have instrumentals. It's not for you to sit there and think, wow, he played good. That's okay for you to think that. I do. But I take that moment to speak to him what's in my heart. That's what you're supposed to do. That's thanksgiving. <laughs> Vocalized. Vocalized. And it's fitting for a nation to set aside a day of thanksgiving and say to our God, thank you, God, for blessing us with a country that has declared all men free and that protects our liberties and defends our freedom, that we can believe and have religious freedom and freedom of life and freedom of liberty. You know, we've just experienced Thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but we had to go through about four or five jackets to find one that I could get all the way across and buttoned. <laughs> this was it. So the rest of the clothes matched the jacket. <laughs> Thanksgiving. Food, football, and napping. Yeah. And retail sales. I'm sure I contributed a little to that this week. But the truth is, Thanksgiving is not about those things. Certainly wasn't originally. It really wasn't about the pilgrims. Now, they did. You'll like this, Larry. We hunted twice this week and didn't see anything. But we did get blessed the week before. Shot two deer in 30 minutes. Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah. Eating some of it today. And the pilgrims didn't have turkey and dressing. <laughs> if they had cranberry, it wasn't cranberry sauce. It was just cranberries. They didn't have pumpkin pie. That, that kind of eating wasn't even in, introduced to that culture yet. The friendly Indians brought venison. They brought deer. So the, our, the pilgrims probably had deer that day. But Thanksgiving as we know it, and actually they celebrated for three days, not one day. But they were celebrating a successful harvest, their first successful harvest. But it was some years later that the Thanksgiving that we come to know came into being. In 1789, following a proclamation issued by President George Washington, America celebrated the first day of Thanksgiving to God under its new constitution. That same year, the, Pre uh, the Protestant Episcopal Church, of which President Washington was a member, announced that the first Thursday in November would become its regular day for giving thanks unless another day be appointed by the civil authorities. But the truth is, only the states honored it on some level, and not all the states did. It wasn't uniform. Much of the credit of the adoption of the later annual National Thanksgiving Day may be attributed to Miss Sarah Joseph Hale, the editor of Godey's Ladies Book. She wrote nursery rhymes. For 30 years, she promoted the idea of a National Thanksgiving Day, contacting president after president until President Abraham Lincoln responded in 1863 by setting aside the last Thursday of November as a National Day of Thanksgiving. Over the next 75 years, presidents followed Lincoln's president annually Declaring a national Thanksgiving Day, then in 1941, Congress permanently established the fourth Thursday of each November as a national holiday. Now, that's historically how we got there. And actually, that lady is the one you can thank for the turkey dressing and the pumpkin pie and the cranberry sauce. She had recipes and everything else that she would share her ideas. But a Lincoln's original 1863 Thanksgiving proclamation came, spiritually speaking, at a pivotal moment in our country. During the first week of July of that year, the Battle of Gettysburg occurred, resulting in the loss of some 60,000 men. Four months later in November, Lincoln delivered his famous Gettysburg Address. It was while Lincoln was walking among the thousands of graves there at Gettysburg that he committed his life to Christ, as he explained to a friend. Did you know this? I didn't. This is Lincoln's own words, writing to a friend. When I left Springfield to assume the presidency, I asked the people to pray for me. I was not a Christian. When I buried my son, the, fear, the severest trial of my life, I was not a Christian. 
But when I went to Gettysburg and I saw the graves of thousands of our soldiers, I then and there consecrated myself to Christ. Out of adversity and great price, Abraham Lincoln was moved to issue proclamation to set aside a day to be thankful to God. See, God is the intended target of thanksgiving, not target. Our Thanksgiving holiday is not about food and football or napping, even though those things are wonderful and I did them. It's not about retail sales. I did that too. It's about being thankful. It's about being thankful. Then it says, enter with praise. That word is tahila. Definition of that means praise, song or hymn of praise, adoration, thanksgiving, paid to God, act of general or public praise, praise demanded by qualities or deeds or attributes of God, acknowledging God's renown, acknowledging God's fame, acknowledging God's glory, that God is worthy to be praised. See, God will be praised. If we fail to praise Him, then the creation underneath our feet will cry out to Him. See, it'd be interesting to know that in the end times when it talks about the increase of natural disasters, if that's nothing more than nature crying out to God because of a created being that inhabits that earth is failing to do it themselves. It's just a thought. Scripture says, if you will not lift them up, then the rocks and stones will cry out. And I believe we're seeing an escalation of rocks and stones crying out to God. We're to enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. We progress from thanking Him for being alive and being healthy and blessed to then begin naming those blessings one by one. We declare, every one of them, what God has done in our life. And we praise Him for it. That's praise in a nutshell. Make a list. Create memorials. Declare with your words and with your songs all the great things that God has done for you. See, in our society, we're trying to remove memorials. We have memorials throughout this land that our forefathers put there as memorials to say what God has done for us. But now we have a move within our society to remove those memorials that are declarations of praise of what God has done. The Ten Commandments isn't in that courtroom just because it looks pretty. It's there because it was the foundation of what we were built upon. It's a memorial. It's a monument. Trying to remove crosses. Thankfulness is gratitude for where you're at. But praise is recounting it and declaring to everyone how you got there. <laughs> you're thankful that you're here. But let me praise him and tell you what he did to get me here. That's praise. And this process is not just for you individually. You should be individually thanking him and praising him. You should in your private practice and your devotional life constantly be thanking Him, being in an attitude of thankfulness and praise. But this is also a pattern for public life. This scripture, to enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise, is a, is a, is a command, it's a word spoken to a congregation, to a group of people publicly to do that. The point of entering with thanksgiving and praise is that you're not to come here mindlessly, without intentions. You should come here with intentions. You should come here with something to give. It says, in the, enter His courts with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. And then what does it say? Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. You're to come here with something to give. Not empty-handed, not empty-minded, or empty-hearted, you're to come here with thankfulness. Give a gift of thanks to Him. Give an offering of thanks. That word thanks is a little bit different than thanksgiving. That word is yada. And it actually means to throw, to shoot, cast, or shoot like an arrow. 
Your words have a target. And you're to come here with that intention to cast down, to throw down, to give thanks. Laud, praise, confess, confess the name of God. Confess sin to give thanks for the forgiveness of your sins. We're to bring our confession of thankfulness and our gift of gratitude. Lay down our gift of thanksgiving and praise. See, in the tabernacle, they, they would bring grain offerings and peace offerings. I've kind of looked at those two offerings because those two offerings were not mandatory offerings. They were free will offerings that they would bring. One, the, the uh, uh, peace offering was actually from the flock, the best of the flock, not lacking, unblemished. And then the uh, grain offering would be fine oil, fine flour, fine grains. It was something that was not the least of the flock, but the best of the flock. It was not something that was been sitting on the storehouse shelf for a long time. It was the best of the storehouse shelf that they brought in. It wasn't inferior. It wasn't lacking. It was quality. And it was given with cost. See, when we're taking the offering here on Sundays, it's not a separate act of worship. It's a part of your thanksgiving and your coming into His courts with praise. It's a seamless act of worship. It kind of brings new edge to the old saying, put your money where your mouth is. I mean, if you are coming into His courts with thanksgiving, or His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise, then you should be ready to lay down your offerings to Him. Put your money where your thanks is. Put your money where your praise is. Don't just walk in here and rattle your thanks and praise and think that nothing should be required of your best. Remember that old song? Some of you may remember. I don't know why. It popped in my head yesterday. And I was singing it when I got up this morning. Here it goes. <clears throat> I, <laughs> I'll explain it after I've sung it. And I'll look around and see if anybody recognizes it. Hear ye the Master's call, give me thy best. For be it great or small, that is his test. Do then the best you can, not for reward, not for the praise of men, but for the Lord. Every work for Jesus will be blessed. But He asked from everyone His best. Our talents may be few, these may be small, but unto Him is due our best, our all. How many of you remember that? There's a few. <laughs> well, I guess that's got me in that category too. <laughs> I remember probably between 1970 and 1973, the little church that we were at, and I remember it, it was those asbestos tiles. You know how they, you could tell asbestos tiles because the asbestos tiles were about 8 to 10 inches, and the, the ones that aren't asbestos are a foot. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, just, I didn't know that as a kid, but I know that now. But remembering it, had that old brown asbestos floor tile through that old building in those youth books that were blue and white. And that was a song that was, it was probably written in the 1930s, I'm sure. It kind of has that fight song or school alma mater kind of sound, you know. <laughs> but he wants our best. That's the name of the song. He wants our best. You should enter this place with the intentions of not only verbally laying down your thanks and praise to God, but you should bring your offerings of praise and thanksgiving as well. You don't have time to dis I don't have time to discuss a full-length teaching on tithe and offerings and alms. We'll get there. But people in the church have a lot of crazy ideas about tithes and offerings, mostly motivated out of looking for a loophole of why we won't pay them. It's true. But we see Jesus had a treasure. They took up offerings. They had a surplus 
to go purchase things with? You remember who the treasurer was? Some look at the Abraham tithing to Melchizedek as being voluntary, not mandatory. That it, was a, it, it, it wasn't like the Mosaic law, that it was a mandatory tithe, and now we're under the new covenant, so maybe we don't have to tithe. Some would look at the Abraham tithe given to Melchizedek as being a spoil of war or not repeated on a weekly basis. Some would look at the traditional view that comes from Malachi that equates your failing to tithe as you being under a curse, being placed under a curse because you're, you're robbing God. I'd like you to step back just for a minute and take a little journey with me. I'm not saying any of that's right or wrong. I'll leave that to you. But I want you to step back and just look at it from what I think Jesus' purpose in dying on the cross and sending the Holy Spirit was all about. That we'd step back and consider a few points, typically maybe not associated with giving. But I believe they're important points. Where is the law today? Did it get done away with just because Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected? No, it's not. Hebrews 10, 16, New Testament tells you, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law upon their heart. And on their mind, I will write them. Jesus has written his law on your heart and on your mind. Jesus has put his spirit within you. We don't live under the law. We live according to the spirit. Hello? Stay with me. Galatians 5.18 says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Living by the law and living by the Spirit are a contradiction. They cannot coexist. 2 Corinthians 9.7 says, Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, but under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I don't know about you, but God's never purposed in my heart less than a tenth. Maybe that's because I grew up in church, but he's never purposed in my heart less than a tenth. It says that my God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Amen? I got next news for you. When you get to that thousandth hill, he owns the cattle on the next thousand hills as well. He owns it all. That term is there to tell you of manyness. He's trying to show you the vastness, the cattle on a thousand hills, and that God owns it all. God is actually, by His Spirit, prompting us to be obedient, to follow through with things that He's purposed in our heart. This brings up an interesting question when we look at Malachi. Is it possible to rob God? I'm going to answer this in this way. Because... I try to live by the Spirit, and I know that He's written His Word in my heart, and He's written His Word in my mind. And when the Holy Spirit has prompted and purposed within your heart of what you should do, and then you do not do it, or you ignore it, or you refuse to, you certainly, in some instances, may be lying, or stealing, or disobeying, or quenching, or grieving the Holy Spirit or the call of God through His Holy Spirit. You are in a personal relationship with Almighty God, the Creator of all things. You really... Would you really be willing to listen to what God says in your heart and purposed in your heart to do and then look at him bold face and say, I'm not going to do it. I don't think so. See, we can argue and on the Old Testament practice, New Testament practice, how we're supposed to carry it out. But I'm just trying to tell you to obey the Holy Spirit. Obey what he's instructed you to do. Amen. Quit coming with lip service to the Lord. Lay it down with thankfulness. Lay it down with praise. Not just your money, but your life. Luke 21, 1 through 4. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, 
Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they, for all, for they all out of their surplus put into the offering. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. See, nobody told her to do that. There wasn't a scripture that told her to do that. Many were giving out of their surplus. Kind of indicating that a kind of a percentage, if you will. Well, what would they know in the New Testament? But Old Testament, they were probably bringing tithe. Giving out of their surplus, it says. But what did she bring? She brought everything she had. She gave everything that she had to a God who owns it all. She wanted to give it all. See, are you hearing me? Kind of quiet. I don't get into the trivial argument of tithe. I just believe it's something you're supposed to do. I do. I don't look at it as legalism or law. I think it's, it's something that God has purposed in my heart to do. That I should do. The tithe really is an entry level of giving. There's offerings and there's alms. Tithe is entry. And I sat there thinking about it. How traditionally we use Malachi to tell you to tithe. And if you don't tithe, you're rather than God and you're under a curse. Do we really need a curse to do what's entry level? Whew. When Jesus came to remove the curse, but yet we have to be driven by one. When the truth is, I can guarantee you, He's purposed in your heart to do more than a tithe. Barak is the last word. To bless. To kneel. To kneel, to bless, to be blessed. Blessed oneself, to bless, to be blessed and adored, to cause to kneel. To praise, to salute. And the flip side of it is to curse. I place more emphasis, I think, on this gift being physical because it moves you to actually do something physical where the other thanks is more verbal. It's a confession. And I tie Barak as a physical expression of kneeling and acknowledging with your body your adoration for God. Romans 12.1 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So you lay down your life in service to the Lord, both in striving to live a godly life, in serving the Lord in various areas of ministry. You're blessing the Lord when you do that. Not being conformed to this world, but being conformed to the image of Christ. You're blessing God when you do that. It's an act of worship to say no to sin and yes to God. Showing up to be used for one day with a dad or Malachi dads or our after school programs that have to be driven with volunteers. When you do those things, it's an act of worship and it blesses God. Can you imagine the blessing that God receives when you walk out of this place and you go tell somebody about Jesus? You lead them to Christ. And then you walk in, not only you are entering his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, but now a new person in Christ is walking in and doing the same. Do you not think that the Lord is blessed because of the sacrifice you physically did, the risk that you took? You followed in obedience to what he told you to do and what his spirit's been prompting you to do. Bless his name, worshiping him for who he is, for his fame, and for his glory. And creating memorials and monuments of praise. I have a couple of memorials and monuments with me today. One I wear all the time. Because I was a honky-tonk bound piano player. I was going to weld and play in honky-tonks and that was my life goal. And if I could make it to Nashville, all the better. But I was content be a honky-tonk player. And therefore, I wrote school off a long time ago. But when I finally got saved, met that beautiful young lady, got right with Jesus, decided I better go to school. What else do I know but music? 
going to be a music education major. I had to take nine hours worth of courses with no credit just to get me prepared to take a course for credit. Because I was not prepared. When I took math, it had been 13 years since I'd had any kind of math at all. I sat in the largest class, algebra class at Sam Houston, over 200 people. People were, there were not enough tables and chairs. People were sitting on the floor. The guy's speaking Greek. I have no idea what he's talking about. The first test, you had to get the first answer right. Take that answer and put that in the rest of your equations for the test. Guess what I made? Zero. <laughs> Guess what I did? I walked out and dropped that class. I knew I was in trouble. And then I kind of researched it and I took finite math. Took finite math. I failed it. Well, I got a D, but D ain't no good. So I, I, I knew I was going to fail it in the class, but I kept going anyway. Because I thought, I got to get over this. I got to learn something. So I took that class again the next semester. And got a C, hallelujah. I was done with my math. But through the process of college, especially when I got to summer school, I took some summer school classes and I realized what my problem was I got bored in a long semester. But in, all of a sudden in summer school, I'm making A's. Wow, I can do this. And I, I never cared about a high school ring. I figured that'd just be around the neck of some girl. You know, I had a, you're going with somebody and they wear your ring around their neck. At least that's the way it was. I'm like, I'll probably never see it again. But this ring I wanted because it's my Ebenezer stone. It's look what God brought me through. Look what God, it's more than a college degree. It's what he's done in my life and my heart and how he changed me and how he redirected me. Look, that's gratitude. I'm thankful. And I have a memorial. I have a monument that I look at and I thank him for. It. This is another one. This is a monument, a memorial. This began November 1984. I'll read you what it says. This is before computers, young people. Before Excel spreadsheets. When you had to do your budget on Ledger. Right? Linda and I got married in December 1984. I started this Ledger in preparation of that marriage, November 1984. Beginning income, net, $1,130. And I keep this as a monument of what God has brought me through. Because you get, oh, about 10 pages down in here. There's a student loan that when she graduated, I knew we were going to have to start paying. And I was dreading that. And we started new semester. I quit my job. I'm going to college now. She's working but the income didn't change much. And I'm sitting there looking at what our income is and I'm looking at what our bills are and what it's going to cost for us to live month to month. And I'm like, we're a hundred bucks off. I'm a hundred bucks short of us making it month to month. And I had this book. And I remember closing this book and I just I set the kitchen counter and I just laid my head down. I'm like, Lord, I want to tithe. But that tithe is about what I'm short. <laughs> Lord, how am I going to do that? How can I make that, Lord God? I mean, this is just barely getting by as it is. What am I going to do? I was already paying on that school loan. It's in my budget. The phone rings. I answer it. It's the credit union of which the school loan came from. And he's saying, or she said to me, Sir, I just want to inform you that you don't need to be paying on this school loan. You really don't have to start paying on it till a year after she's graduated. Hallelujah. Because that's the room I need. And all I can tell you, I know in the charismatic church, there's a lot about giving and reaping and all this stuff, and there's a lot of pirates out there. There's a lot of them not sending back. But the, what God has purposed in your heart to do, you should do. And I believe when it says in Malachi, when he says, try me and see if I'm not going to be faithful, I believe that's true. I don't believe that changed between Old Testament and New Testament. 
I believe it's still true. And this is a monument to me that that is true. That he's always been faithful. I've kept this through the years. It ends in June 94. By that time I got a spreadsheet. Didn't have to do that anymore. But I kept this to look through. I can see how tight it was. I can see what we were paying. I got a, I got a handicap apartment because it was cheaper. The light switches are lower and the electrical plugs are higher. And the bathroom door is bigger. And there's rails and a seat in the bathtub. That was cool. I thought that was all right. I'll take it. It's cheaper. I only want it for a year. I'm going to look for something cheaper after that. And I can show you where I went for $333 to rent for $150. It's a monument. It's a testimony. It's something I can look at and say, thank you, God, for what you brought me through. That you've taken me from there to here. And I praise you. I'm thankful about being here. And I praise you for how you got me here. That is entering his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Stand up. We're just going to sing a little more. Now I'll let you go. You don't want to watch the Texans till the second half anyway. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Lord, we are thankful. We are thankful that your word is true. We are thankful, Lord God, that you are who you say that you are. And Lord, that your, your truths of sowing and reaping is true. I pray, Father, you would purpose in our heart what we're supposed to do. And help us to be obedient and thankful. Let us be thankful for all that you've done. Lord, remove grumbling from our lips. Remove complaining from our lips. Remove negative from our mouth and our thoughts. Protect our heart and our mind from that. Lord, as we were talking about putting on the armor, that we would take all thoughts obedient to Christ, not allowing room for negative thoughts. That we know every good gift comes from you. We know that you are worthy of praise. You are worthy of all praise. And we thank you, Lord God, for where you have brought us. And Lord, we thank you for how you've done it. Just as the people of Israel, Lord, struggled with being grateful that they were taken out of captivity by God who loved them so much. And God had a plan to provide a dwelling place, a connection with them on earth. And that he would guide them through the wilderness. He provide their every need. Lord, we're grateful. We are grateful for all that you have done. And we give you thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. i
thank you Lord God you are worthy of all praise we thank you Father for all the many blessings that you have given to us Lord and I pray that each one even now Father in their heart are just listing them to you and thanking you for your goodness and thanking you Father that we do live in a land Lord with all of its struggles and its trials and its problems Father we live in a land where we can freely come and worship you and we thank you Father for that we thank you Father for those that have shed their blood Lord that have given their lives to protect this country that would move upon even presidents to come and say we need to set aside a day to thank God the creator of all things the one in whom all things come from And I pray, Father, you move us as a nation back to that kind of heart. We thank you, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name, we give thanks. Amen. Amen. One moment, please. Just one moment. Just stay with me just a moment. I just want to let y'all know that I was really dug this morning and the Lord was stressing on me. The, long, the young little lady that had cancer, when she came down and went up there and told her how proud I was of her. Because when I went through my cancer, I wasn't anywhere near as well as doing it as she was. And the Lord was really blessing her. And also, in our prayer life when we're praying we're asking God we need to remember to thank him first for all the things that he's done yep. because that is affirming what he's done yes. and when you pray pray the word because when you pray out of the Bible and what he says there that is power because he said, just like with infirmed, he wants none of his children to be infirmed. So when you pray that, and you pray that according to the thing, that is according to his will, yeah. and it will be answered. Amen. So Amen. that's what. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. Okay. Now there is a chapter in uh, Matthew 23 that's an implication as far as tithing. Yeah. 
It says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter, which they did have to pay a tenth of the tithes, mm -hmm. without neglecting the former. So that's an implication. Amen. If they were paying, giving a tenth of the cumin and the other ingredients, they were giving a tenth of the tithe. Amen. So he says, don't neglect the farmer. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's good. Amen. Father, we thank you for this day. And Lord, I pray, Father, that everyone that walks out of this place, I pray that they were drawn closer and nearer to you. I pray that their hearts are encouraged. And I pray, Father, they're encouraged and challenged to walk out of this place and live a life of thankfulness and thanksgiving and a life that is quick to praise and give credit where credit is due. For you are worthy of all praise and all glory. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.